Well, I guess I'll spin it up. Uh, I wonder where everybody is or if it's just that, uh, that many attending. So, um, welcome to Big Data Ignite. Thanks for showing up. Uh, my name is Ross Wagner. I'm an analytics consultant over at Medic. I'm going to be talking about mapping detail dependencies with NeoPJ. So I'm going to start out with an introduction, uh, briefing over what Thematic does, uh, talk a little bit, I have some questions for you, a little bit of audience participation, and then we'll talk about um, if I actually targeted my presentation correctly. We'll jump into the graph databases and talk a little bit about the Cypher query language, uh, jump into the problem definition uh, where we're trying to solve the graph database. And then I have one use case example from a PLC. All right, so Dometic uh, designs, delivers uh, solutions to optimize supply chains. They do that with material handling technology, process improvement, software, and automation technology, uh, some of which I've shown down here on the bottom. So I love robots, I love watching them. Worldwide presence, so they're in North America, South America, Europe, Asia Pacific, and China. Been in business since 1819, uh, when they developed the steam-powered crane to do some warehouse automation. And after a series of acquisitions, both by and of Dematic, uh, in 2016, Keon Group purchased them, so they're out of Germany. So that's our whole thing. So a little bit of audience participation here. Um, I put this slide in here because every time I mention graph databases, I kind of get blank looks or puzzled looks. So I just wanted to kind of check the audience to see if I, uh, where we land here, and I can teach my presentation on the fly if need be. But raise your hands if you're familiar with graph databases. Just a little bit. OK, just a handful. Raise your hand uh, if you use it to make a living. Okay, so, so far so good. <laughs> Raise your hand if you, if you know what polyglot uh, persistence is. Never heard the term? Okay. Raise your hand if you are familiar with data warehousing and business intelligence. Everybody should probably raise their hand there, right? Okay, raise your hand if you do that for a living. Just, okay. All right, well, I didn't do too bad. I expected a little bit more uh, data warehousing. Um, but uh, land well in the graph database stuff. So, so what I hope to provide today in the presentation is just a high level overview of graph uh, database technology and Cypher, which is the query language. I'm gonna touch on polyglot persistence and then uh, show a use case. So we're developing a proof of concept to support uh, data, web, data warehousing ETL with the graph database. So I have to shamelessly admit, that I'm using you guys as a dry run to do a POC for our R&D group. Uh, the idea is I get it far enough along that I set the hook that they go, oh yeah, this is feasible and we see the value because you can actually show me. And uh, then they'll take it from there, hopefully. And I don't have any budget left. So, they're gonna have to. so this brings us to graph databases. So there's a number of different graph databases out on the market. Uh, Neo4j seems to have uh, a big market share right now. Uh, there's also a bunch of different types of graphs and graph algorithms. So there's more than you can shake a stick at. When you're talking about Neo4j, you're talking about labeled property graphs. Uh, like this one here, we have objects that are represented as nodes, so one, two, three, and four. And then you have edges that represent relationships. And blue box over there is a label. Uh, so you can put labels on nodes, and then you can put properties on nodes and on the relationships. And then the relationships themselves can have a type, so feeds as well. So if you read this graph, uh, you can see that there's a person named Ross who feeds a cat named Cody. Now is the time to feed Cody because he's always hungry. If you look at the other side, you can see that there's a cat named Shotzi who has a relationship with a mouse, which is Chase's, and that mouse's name is Fresh Meat. So I'm guessing that my cat's breached my security and altered my slides here. Um, Shotzi calls all of her uh, mouse friends fresh meat. So um, this is just a 
quick little depiction of what a graph database is and how to read them. Normally you think of uh, pictures on a whiteboard of graphs, but they are usually represented mathematically in set theory, so you have the uh, set n of all the nodes, one through eight on here, and then set r of all the relationships with the tuples for each node. So that's typically one way to represent graphs. Another way, so this graph on the left, that's the picture. You can use linked lists uh, to represent the graph on the left there, or you can use an adjacency matrices. In the adjacency matrices, the ones just re represent a connection between the columns. So uh, column two is connected to one here, because there's one in there. And if you get into all the graph algorithms, you can actually put more than just one in there. You can put values in there and use that to do distance, shortest distance calculations and other things like that. Um, that's beyond the scope of this presentation, but I just thought I'd share that. There are a lot of applications for graphs. They're all over the place. So fraud detection, you guys may have heard of the Panama Papers. Maybe you've heard about that. So that was done a lot with Neo4j. They, they set up a great big Neo4j database and gave it to all of the uh, reporters to do their work. Biological networks, so the gene mapping, Anybody that's uh, been an admin for unified user management will appreciate graphs for identity and access mapping. Talk, uh, what I'm talking about today is ETL, so that's an information system. How to map that. You can use it as a recommender engine. Graphs can be used for that. Uh, basically, if uh, you know that Bob bought a phone and he has a brother, Joey, you might want to try and sell the same brand to him. Social networks, everybody's got their bacon number, right? Figuring out that. And transportation, so calculating routes, uh, rerouting, optimizing routes. Graphs are pretty heavy in that as well. Network analysis would be another one. So that brings us to second computer language. So one of the tricks uh, to querying graph databases is patterns. So I have a pattern in the upper left-hand corner there where we have blue node points to a tan node and then points to a green node and then the tan node points to a green node. So this pattern, you've picked it because it pulls something out of the graph that you're interested in. And the way to think about it is if you look at the big node in the center, uh, you can set an anchor with the blue node. You might do that with the node ID or you might do that with a property. And if you uh, configure your Cypher query correctly, when it runs, it will pull all of those matching patterns out of your graph database for you and display it as a separate set of graphs or in table form. So. The good news is, uh, most everybody here is familiar with uh, SQL, right? That's kind of ubiquitous, right? The syntax is pretty similar. Uh, there's just a few kind of exceptions so there's not a huge barrier. I have a coworker, Samantha, that uh, picked up graph databases and was doing queries inside of a week. So it's easy to uh, move over there. Uh, some of the differences are though that uh, in SQL, you do a select against the column and that comes out of a table or a view from. And if you needed to extend that relationship, you'd use a join, right? Everybody knows don't make too many joins because you got table scans, right? Big own location. In Cypher, uh, the matching most equivalent one is return, and that you use to pull back nodes, relationships, or paths, and you do that with a match to the pattern, like we were showing on the diagram beforehand. And then if you need to create or update in SQL, it's the insert and update row operation. And in Cypher, it's actually called create or for update, it's merge, and that occurs against nodes and relationships. In SQL, you'll have a group by to do aggregation. So if you use an aggregate function, like a sum or an average up in your select, you gotta have the group by clause and put the column. In Cypher, that's uh, implicit, it's implied. If you use the function, it actually does the aggregation and it pulls it out of the match. So slightly different. So going back to the graph, uh, the label graph with the cats. Uh, up on the upper left, that's the left side of it. And so I dissected a Cypher query uh, for you uh, based on that graph to show how you would actually configure that. 
So you start off with the match, and then if you want to reference a note, you put it in parentheses. The little N in front of there is an identifier so that you can reference it later when you want to get at properties. And then the label is person, like up there, so you can see that. Then the actual relationship is modeled inside of brackets. And it too has a identifier. And you can see that it also has the type of that relationship, which is feeds. And then you'll see a dash and a greater than sign, which uh, tells you the direction of the relationship to the next node, which is a cat. And that has an identifier M. And so you can anchor this, or you can actually pin it down by doing a where clause, and you have n.name. That's referencing uh, the first node, uh, property name, and setting it to Ross. And then you can do the same with n, or excuse me, m.n, where you get Cody, and then r.time, which is the relationship equals now. So that would pin this down for you. Type, right? You'd only get this one back. If you wanted more uh, parts of the graph, you would just loosen this up and take certain things out of it. Sometimes you can just put a single anchor on the front node and just say, give me everything, just to take a look at it. Just a couple more examples I'm just going to run through really quick. So in this case, we're matching uh, the employees that have a relationship with cost center and the return is returning all those nodes, both the cost center and the employee. The next one is pretty much the same query, but now what I've done is shown a shorthand notation. If you put braces in there and reference the property uh, in equal signs and quotes, you can actually get a property there. So that's actually equivalent to a where clause. The next one, um, we've used the type. Uh, so we're looking for employees that have a manager's relationship with the same cost center Hopefully that's one person, right? We're just returning that for you. The next one is an interesting feature. Uh, we actually set the pattern to a variable. So path equals that pattern. And we have a node with uh, no criteria on it. And in our relationship, there's a ID there, but there's also that star 1.5. Dot dot and what that is saying is give me any relationship from N to M where there's one to five relationships between it. So that kind of becomes important if you have large, long paths that you don't want to return all of them. You can just say, give me anything that has a single hop, give me anything from one to five. Uh, so that allows you to control the length of what you return. And then the last one is just to create, which is match a node uh, with a label cat and uh, another one with a label mouse. And then uh, where the name is Shotzi on A, and where the name on B is Fresh Meat. And go ahead and do a create with the first node, the relationship chases, and B. So what that did is it did that right side of that graph, right? It just created that. That's how you would do that. OK, so that brings us to polyglot persistence. Uh, it's not, uh, polyglot persistence is kind of a fancy name for use the right tool for the job. I have more than one tool. The two things that you can run into is you can run into the Swiss Army knife, right, where you have products and there's so many different uh, tools on it that it's actually not useful. And then the other thing you have is the hammer nail syndrome, right? All I have is a hammer, so somehow whenever I have a problem, I take the problem and magically formulate it in, uh, into a nail so that I can have a justification for using a hammer. Uh, in this particular case, I stole this example from Martin Fowler. And you can see here that there's all sorts of different types of persistence in here. There's Redis, which is a key value in memory database. There's some relational databases. There's Mongo, which is a column based, and Cassandra, which is also a column based. And then, of course, there's Neo4j over there for a recommender system. So that would be a structural recommender system. All right, so that was, we just got past all the introductory stuff. And now we can actually get into the problem definition. So I'm part of Analytics Infrastructure Services. And uh, we own everything on the right side, all the blue boxes of the gray box with WCS. We refer to that as OA, Operation Analytics Software. 
The box on the left, which is labeled WTS, is the uh, warehouse control system. So that is all the software that is running all our automation equipment that's loaded with all sorts of sensors. And that information is being put in their database. So what we do is when we work with a customer and we have all sorts of warehouses all over the place, we come in and say, give us some bare metal and throw a PM on it. We drop a database on there called GPL, and then we set up replication to pull the data across. That way we don't interfere with their warehouse operations because they get really upset. We just pull their equipment down. Then uh, we, how the system works then is we have task schedulers, so you're guessing this is Windows, right? Uh, that fires off batch controller at a 15 minute interval. And that actually coordinates all the ETL packages firing. So we have a generic SQL extractor that pulls the data out of the database and writes it to an intermediate file. And then that gets pulled into the transform packages, they write an intermediate file, then that gets pulled into the load packages, and then they push it to a data warehouse. We then hook our visualization software up there, which is actually Tableau, and uh, do our job. So all, all is good from a developer standpoint in this system. They've come up with very cohesive packages. They're loosely coupled. They're easy to expand and easy to maintain. However, uh, my job is to actually implement uh, these processes out of the box is what we hope for. Okay? Uh, but there are some challenges with that. So I actually have only been at Dematic since uh, end of May and have not done a lot in ETL uh, warehousing. But there are over 350 packages, files, and tables with over 400 relationships in this. And we've got a whole bunch of uh, warehouses that we do. If you have to go down to the field level or the column level, there's another 1,900 or another 1,200 relationships with it for the fields. That's way beyond comprehensive, so that's a complex system, right? Uh, it may not be a big data warehousing system for some of you, uh, but that's beyond what I can comprehend. So it's a complex system, so if we can't do out of the box and we have to customize it, that could be a problem. Well, here's why, we, why out of the box is kind of rare, is because we get a lot of variation and we have to customize our ETL almost all the time. We get variation from our legacy products. So I'm actually working on a project right now we have a legacy product that doesn't interface directly with our OA, so they are writing the interface. And we are having lots of arguments about what data needs to get in the interface. <laughs> so we get variation there. Our actual OA, OA products are evolving themselves. So uh, you'll see in one of the pictures I have where there's some blank spots where just between 2.6 and 2.7, stuff changed in our uh, ETL. Uh, we also have third-party products that we acquire um, that we have to integrate with. And we can also be in a position where uh, we have a customer that has their WCS that's not ours, and we have to integrate with their WCS as a third-party product. Another source variation that we have to overcome and, and why the graph database has become important is that there is variation in warehouse configurations. So we're not just in a single company where we are adding different parts of the company. We're going to each different type of warehouse. And a grocery, a warehouse that supports grocery operations is different than a warehouse that supports pharmaceutical or garments or retail or manufacturing. So you get in this position where uh, you're trying to shake out your ETL pipeline and get it working and there's no data. Well, was that supposed to be empty or did the ETL fail? You have the no value problem, right? Uh, and with that many packages and stuff tracing through that becomes a little bit time consuming. Uh, the other thing that we face from our, uh, uh, steam of, our standpoint of a team is that uh, we're also competing for resources too, right? So we're trying to foster that internship, come work with us afterwards. It wasn't a great working Matty in uh, AIS. And, uh, Quite frankly, if you throw on one of these customization projects, it may traumatize them so much that they go work somewhere else. Um, I know that when I first started, it, it was pretty daunting to get that um, up and running. And then we're always faced with reduced implementation time and cost, right? That's always the pressure that we have to do. So anytime that we can uh, do that, uh, we get out ahead. 
So the problem definition, variation forces customization of the process. Out of the box is actually quite rare. We actually joke about it. It's more like out of the bag. And uh, the process is big and complex, uh, making customization difficult. And uh, experienced resources are not ready, readily available. And so it takes a long time to train them up on this. So what we need is tools that provide visibility ETL process at scale. So nobody's actually seen the beast in its entirety. It's always little file snippets here working there. So, we go back and we look at how polyglottinated we are, uh, persistent, something like that. I'm not sure how the plural to say polyglot. But uh, you'll see that we added uh, one storage mechanism in there, which is ETL, right? We're taking advantage of Neo4j's ability to map relationships in a graph. Uh, it wouldn't make sense to do that, say, in a relational database, right? Because you have the joints and it doesn't graphs, but trees are graphs, right? So it's easier to do a new j So to start out with, uh, it's always a good idea to do a graph model, and uh, this one's not that exciting. It's kind of linear, so I'm hoping that's an artifact of the fact that it's actually a data pipe, and it's not that I oversimplified it. <laughs> but what, what you have is, on the left side, is uh, packages and then next, they have a relationship with the file, which is the file can be a source for that package, or it can actually be a des destination. So you're actually seeing source, package, destination, source, package, destination map here. Uh, then also the file can be a source for a table on the load. So when it finally hits the database, you have a new node type of table. And files have columns, and so do tables, and then tables make up databases, right? Uh, we use Tableau, so if you're familiar with Tableau, there's this notion of uh, a worksheet, right? And you build up worksheets and then you put them together in a dashboard. Well, the worksheet connects to the database through a data store. So this is the entire connectivity from visualization all the way down to interface uh, column uh, for just packages. This doesn't necessarily include columns in the example I'm going to provide. And this is the beast. Uh, I have to explain this a little bit. Um, this is actually done in a tool called Cytoscape. So Neo4j is kind of nice, and there's a new tool out, Neo4j Bloom, that I haven't really had time because it kind of just came out right before this presentation. I didn't want to incorporate it. So I use a tool called Cytoscape, which is kind of like the AutoCAD or the Visio for uh, graphs. And what this is showing you is the green boxes our data, our data files, the blue, the light blue uh, dots are actually transform packages. <clears throat> the purple ones are load packages. And then the magenta boxes are database tables. So I didn't even get the rest of the dashboards on here, and I don't have the extract because it just got really ugly. You know? <laughs> At some point, you have to really kind of refine your graph so that you can actually tell something like that. Uh, so basically, this is the beast, the overall picture at a package level. And that leads us to a use case example about that. So now that I've got all the stuff in the database, and oh, by the way, I forgot to mention, uh, I was going to have Samantha Koch uh, co-present with me, but she uh, was so traumatized by the data entry to get the graph database up. She went to Wisconsin and went fishing. Um, but she literally, how we got all that data in was by uh, doing a little bit of XML shredding. So the package files and it's SSIS is the tool we're using. Uh, we went in and shred the packages to see what files and stuff it was talking to. And then we did have some of that information that was already in a spreadsheet. We were able to strip that out. And then some of it, we just had to go in package by package, pull it out, put it in a CSV file, and import it in. Um, so anyway, this is the use case uh, that actually our AIS team is asking for, which is troubleshoot an ETL package issue. So as a DWE, which is a data warehouse engineer, uh, I need to know the ETL packages and components related to the package logging and error. 
so that I can employ the process of elimination to isolate the cause of the error. So our as-is process for that right now is very time consuming. Uh, basically what you do is you uh, see from when batch controller runs, you see the package that threw the error, you go to the log, you go, oh, it's that kind of error, and then you kind of go, well, do I think that's the file it read? No, maybe not, but I have to go look at the file and make sure it's okay. Uh, and then I go, it's, the file's okay, then I load the next package into Visual Studio. And I don't know if you're familiar with Visual Studio, but it takes a good minute or two. It's frustrating. I know it's not that much time, but it takes a good minute or two to load it. And then you have to run all around in their graphs and figure out, is there a problem? And if you don't have a problem, then you keep repeating that process. Well, that can cause some problems because, of course, our customers build the most performant networks with huge amounts of bandwidth. So whenever we're out there RDPing, it's like click. And go get a cup of coffee, come back, okay, came back up, and now you can take a look. So there's some performance issues when we're operating on remote systems. Uh, the other point is that the entire chain of packages and data files is not visible. So we don't know the entire pipe for this ETL thread that's running through our data warehouse. And that kind of doesn't allow you to do certain types of debugging scenarios or troubleshooting strategies. So you can't do divide and conquer. Uh, sometimes if you have somebody that's a little bit more experienced with those packages, they'll, if they knew what the file name is, they go, your error is probably right here, right? You could just jump and you don't have to load everything to kind of force it. You don't have to brute force it. Another problem is a lot of times if you end up modifying your ETL packages, you got to test them. You're in production. <laughs> you can't test in production. So you have to take all of those packages and data files pull them across that network with the huge amount of bandwidth, right? That's super fast, no, it's really slow. Put it on your local system and debug it, and test it, and then put it back. And what's really painful is if you don't get all the data files the first time and you have to go back. It's kind of like when you do home improvement, you have to keep going to the warehouse because the guy tells you, you got, oh, you needed this package, you needed that package, right? So that kind of gets to be a problem as well. So, now that we have the, the overall graph loaded in there, how would we get that thread back out of that graph database? Turns out uh, that if you do a match with an unnamed node and you have it pointing with any type of relationship from a node called A, and you say n.name is the name of that particular node, so this is a dim location. So if you guys are familiar with ETL, right? You know that DIMs are kind of lookup tables and fact tables are all the events, right? So if you put that in there, it will look for anything that points to that one, that looks that points at that one, that looks that points at that one, and pulls it all in. There's your entire thread. So now you can take a look at it and go, I wonder if it was, hmm, I don't know if it's a transformer, maybe it's one of those files that it, re it referenced something about, uh, you know, the location, maybe it was a location problem. So immediately you could jump. Right, and go look. So uh, you can pull that back. This, if you're familiar, has anybody used Cypher at all? Neo4j? Okay. A little bit? Neo4j doesn't make them this pretty, so I confess I did pull it in. Uh, one of the problems with Neo4j is that it uh, uh, tries to fit the entire label inside the node, and you get like about four letters. And we have this standard naming convention that's really yeah, our database admin person likes to type. So, <laughs> it's just, <laughs> don't know, can abbreviate, but, uh, so anyway, that is the uh, use case uh, results there. So it, it, I would envision that uh, if the system were to go operational, that uh, the hope is, is that you can find a way to load all that information into a graph database locally on your system. So this is not, putting in a um, globally accessible graph database. It's just a little tiny graph database that you run a couple of scripts, it, load, it looks at your ETL packages and some of your batch controller information stuff, throws it all in there and then you can run a query and start pulling out all your threads to see where the heck do I think this happened, right? Um, so that would be the main use case that we would be going after. And so 
how to set the hook with the R&D folks. So I kind of envision this as, uh, I don't know if you've ever seen any of those documentaries where they say the making of the P-51 or the Y-222 Raptor. And they basically say, we need a plane that does X, Y, and Z. And uh, you three vendors build, build a flying prototype in six months. It's totally ridiculous, right? But somehow they do it. That's kind of the same approach that I'm taking here is that I want to take this far enough along that we can actually run a real query in the database, even though it was hand loaded, and, uh, and show them the value. And then we can talk about the other use cases that they might be interested in. Can everybody read this? I was worried about that. But, so what we have is batch controller that talks in JSON. And the reason, as we were looking at this and going through it by hand, we found out that JSON sets parameters at runtime in the ETL packages. So sometimes when you're debugging and you look at a parameter, you gotta be thinking in the back of your head, did batch controller set this at runtime and this is not the value that you're looking for? <laughs> uh, we need the schema from the warehouse database. Uh, we need the visualization uh, which is in XML, right? So if you go wandering around in a Hello work uh, book file, it's all in XML. And then also, since this is SSIS, this is ETSX, right? So the ETL is also in XML. So we can uh, load the JSON, the text, and the XML uh, in, into our database. And the way that we do that is probably we'd have a separate script uh, over here that would um, do the extract, we go pull the JSON out of batch controller, we can dump the, the uh, controller information and the parameter settings out of batch controller, we can run a query against uh, the warehouse from a script, put it in a CSV file or files, and then we can use a, a uh, it's called C CSV import in, Neo in Neo4j and pull it in. There's another feature too, if you get a chance, um, it's called APOC, so of course NEO, APOC was the driver of the Nebuchadnezzar or something like that. So this is an add-in that allows you to load XML directly right into the graph. So by doing the both of those, you can kind of pull the packages in and pull all the, some of the other relationships in and run a few SQL queries and tune it, right? So this is kind of giving um, first approximation to our R&D team. This is how you might do it. It's always good to go on a meeting with uh, a drawing to change, not a blank whiteboard, right? Because then they think of anything. But, so I put this together for that. Um, and that is my last slide. Uh, that. That's, if you want to ask questions, otherwise, let's see, I've got I'm good until 310, right? If you're interested, I did fire up the over day here. Uh, so I just connected here. And so I'll just take up a little time. I just want to go get coffee. Uh, this is Neo4j here. This is showing all the nodes and stuff like that. One of the nice features of uh, Neo4j when you do Cypher queries is uh, if you put a comment in top of it, it saves that as the name of the query. So I went ahead and did a couple of these. So here's a query where I'm going after dim operator. So if you run this, uh, boom, there it is. Neo4j has a very irritating feature, which is they bounce the nodes around, so you have to go tap them. So there's the thread, you can mouse over it and kind of do that. Um, you could run another uh, one, but so that's basically, you could do that in any thread or from any node within that graph database and immediately pull up the thread across there. Uh, some of the other use cases that we were looking at had to do uh, with actually, a lot of times when we're working with customers on dashboards, uh, they start getting excited, and can you do this, can you do that, and this, and we're like, we have the data. <laughs> so what would be really nice is if you knew that if you had a certain type of data uh, dashboard, if you, what field that was that need to get integrated, right? So we, since we have the columns in there, we can map the column transitions all the way back to 
in the interface as well. So you immediately know from a dashboard that's the five minute warning. Uh, you'd immediately know uh, what data you needed in there. It happens that the project I'm working on right now uses a legacy system and um, individuals on the team didn't exactly do a good job of explaining what dashboard you could use, so they were kind of wondering, why are you asking for all these fields? We don't want to put these fields in. We've got to get the warehouse running. Why can't you just make this dashboard? And we would say, we didn't really have a good way to go and say, well, you need this timestamp, this ID, this ID, and this timestamp in order to do this dashboard. Now, so we don't have a way to do that before this, but if we map all the columns out, uh, we can immediately justify, you ask for this dashboard, we're asking for these fields, here's the link. And you just run a query. Uh, so it gives you a way to map those across. I would envision that the R&D folks would be interested in it um, simply because if they need to make a change to a package or something, or change a parameter, you're gonna wanna go through the entire graph and say, okay, this change ripples into all these different packages. Uh, and you can get a nice list of all the things that you have to update instead of trying to run it, have it die, run it, or worse yet, we run it because they didn't check it, and uh, we're on production, <laughs> and it blows up. So let, that's just a couple of things. And it's just an example of using a database that's really good at this as opposed to a relational database. So that's the end of the presentation. Any questions? Sure. For when you do these kinds of graphs, um, when you connect notes, sometimes you're able to weight notes by either quantity or importance. Is that a possibility in the database style of these graphs? Oh, yeah. Okay. So that property that we set, which was feeds time equals now, can be you can put a whole set of properties on there. You can also put all sorts of different types on there, so they can have multiple types. Uh, one of the big debates on the relationships uh, uh, is whether to put the field tracking graph database in with the package one, because you can have graphs coexist. Another thing that I didn't really cover very much was that graph databases are really good, they fit good with the agile process because it's extremely easy to just add stuff and take it away, whereas you did that in a relational database with the RI, the referential integrity, you could be asking for trouble, right? But graphs, they're very flexible and they can evolve quickly the same as your app does. Yeah, so you can put properties on nodes and the So, so interesting how you do that using graph. So, just kind of wondering how you get the idea of using the graph to solve this purpose. How did you attempt a few options when you landed on this? Just curious about how you well, chose this. Uh, I actually uh, uh, was work. I used to be in quality assurance and I did audits. And so I use graph databases to hook up all the requirements to the test cases and to the epics so that I can pull the graph up and see, oh, you don't have a test case for this requirement team. You know, check mark, get one. <laughs> and so I was using it for that and to track the development process. And so when I came into here, what they did initially, uh, one of our data sources was actually an Excel spreadsheet, which I, I could probably pull up here, but, uh, it was an Excel spreadsheet, and Samantha uh, had set it up that if there was an overlap on the edge, that was a connection. And then things repeated in the, in the spreadsheet, and it was like, I don't know what gave me a bigger headache, was loading in Visual Studio trying to hunt it, or looking at the Excel spreadsheet trying to figure out, is that connected to that? So graphs just make a natural. Yep. All right, that's one of the pubs, the rotten egg.